How's that? There we go. Cool. Um, hello. Thank you for coming. So today I'm going to talk about the MOR1KX, which is an open risk compliant soft core microprocessor that I started writing a few years ago. But more broadly, I'm going to talk about the open risk project and uh, what goes into developing a microprocessor. And hopefully that's interesting. Um, of course, it's all open source. And I'll point you to where you can get it later on. But I'll start off just a quick intro about me. I'm a digital design engineer by trade. And I started working with the Open Risk Project um, about five years ago or more now. Um, it, it's a cool thing. I quite like it. You know, it's fun to play with microprocessors and Verilog and RTL and put it on FPGAs and see it come to life and hopefully eventually a, into a silicon chip or something. And uh, so I've worked on various parts of the project. Uh, I, I started this processor about three years ago. And actually, these days, I, I do very little on it. It's mainly developed by a couple of other guys, two Stefans. Unfortunately, the, the other Stefan who was going to be here afterwards um, can't be here today. But uh, yeah, it's called the MR1KX. Probably you're not that interested in the etymology of the name. But uh, it's there in small print if you want to look at it later. So what am I talking about? Well, in, in essence, it's, it's a microprocessor, but it's a, it's a soft core. So you can download the source code for this thing and configure it. You can do whatever you want with it, basically. It's, you know, there's tons of different features you can have. You can disable support for certain instructions. You can remove the data cache if you don't need it, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, one of the main, uh, well, actually, get onto that. Well, actually, yeah, one of the first things I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer is some of the hard questions to do with this field. So why would you do this? I get, that asked. I get asked that quite a bit. Uh, why would you want to write a processor for an FPGA? Okay, you know, it's, FPGAs are good for certain things. Probably running processors isn't the best use of an FPGA. They're obviously bigger. Um, it can't run as fast in terms of frequency. Obviously, if it's bigger, it uh, takes more power as well. Versus, you know, obviously I'm comparing it to an uh, application-specific chip, you know, like the little low-power microprocessors you can buy now that are kind of like a Cortex-M3 thing from Freescale or whatever. But there are some advantages. Uh, the main one is that they're fun and that you can write them yourself. But uh, seriously, they are, they are reconfigurable and retargetable. So you have the RTL, as I said, you do whatever you want with it, want with it depending on your application. You can go along, if you want to port that between different FPGA technologies or even put it into a silicon chip, you can. Um, you can have as many of them as you want on an FPGA, it depends how big your thing is. It's also obviously open and transparent and you can see every single line of the circuit that you're describing there and in ensuring that it's either not doing anything nefarious or it's not doing anything stupid. Uh, and again, I mean, people say, I was having this discussion this morning, uh, <laughs> why would you go along and write another one? Why would you do your own? Uh, what's the point? There's tons of other ones out there. It's a, it was described as a, there's a graveyard of sort of half-finished, half-implemented, half-working processes there on open cores, why would, you, why would you add to it? Well, hopefully you're not adding another one into the column of ones which get half done and then left. So having worked on the original open risk implementation or, or worked with it for a number of years, I sort of came to the conclusion that it was in a way a little bit beyond repair in terms of turning it into something which was going to be easy to hack on for people. So. Uh, if you stare at it for six months, okay, maybe you'll understand what's going on and maybe you'll get a, a good idea. But I, I, thought, I thought it would be useful to do a core, write a core, which it didn't take six months of staring at to figure out what was going on, to make it a bit more modular and a bit easier to, to hack on, essentially, for, for people to come along and learn from and modify and extend. Um, and that's helped by obviously having good coding standards. Um, uh, Collaboratively, collaboratively developed is what that's supposed to be. Um, something that has an appropriate license as well. 
I think I'll, I'll have a bit of a rant about that at the end. I think uh, the open source hardware licensing world is is not right. Um, in terms of at least RTL code, stuff that could either go into FPGA or ASIC, it's very unclear why you would want to use a software license on something like that, which is what's been done predominantly so far. Uh, and also checking that it works. Very few of these processes that you download come with a test bench that does little more than take it out of reset and clock it a bit. You know, uh, So that's a bit crap. Has this been achieved? What does what the project achieve? Well, um, first I'll give you a bit of background and explain a little bit more about what this thing is. So as I said, I initially wrote it because the, the main implementation, the OR1200, which you may have heard of, uh, wasn't, wasn't that great. It, it's good. It, I mean, it worked. You'd boot Linux on it, and uh, it was a reliable bit of kit. But um, yeah, I thought, I thought we could do better. Uh, so the Open Risk project, to give you a little bit of background on that, was begun along with Open Cores and, and a ton of other open source IP cores that became available through that site. It was begun by um, a group of Slovenian university students, I think in about 1999. And they went along, did it all, got it working, got, I think they had a Linux port and a GCC port, things like that. Uh, and then they, they fabbed a chip with, a, with the OR1200 in it in about 2003 or four, And then they thought, this is good, we can make money out of this, and then spun off into a company and then never committed a single line of code ever again. So that was nice. Um, but fortunately, a bunch of you know, good engineers came along and picked it up afterwards. So this is a block diagram of the OR1200. Uh, a very simple five-stage in-order um, risk pipeline gets the instruction from memory, figures out what it's supposed to do, and then does it, basically. And then you've got things like your MMUs and, uh, to, to handle virtual memory management, and caches, and everything else you need in a process, like a debug interface, and timers, and whatnot. So specifically, the things that weren't that great about it were, as I said, the code wasn't, wasn't um, very user-friendly. They used tick defines, if anybody here uses Verilog or codes in Verilog. Um, I think this is bad practice, I, I think. Well, tick defines for things which aren't like universal constants um, uh, are bad, I think. So you should use parameters for configuration and things like this. Um, and also, it was licensed under the LGPL. And again, I'll, I'll have a bit of a discussion about that at the end and why I think that's a problem. So the MR1KX. One of, the th one of the things I tried to do with it was emulate, if anybody knows, the Altera proprietary processor, the NEOS. Um, that's quite neat in that they have a nice little graphical tool where you can go along and you can make a trade-off between whether you want it to run fast and thus be a little bit bigger. So if anybody is familiar with um, the concept of you know, the critical path through synchronous digital logic, you'll have, um, you'll have the fastest clock rate you can run it at being defined by the longest path in it, essentially. And so you can make a trade-off between having a short critical path, and therefore you know, you're, you're registering things a lot more, and thus taking up more space. Um, uh, so you can make the trade-off between something that's fast but big, or small, but a little bit slower. And so I, I tried to do that. There's, there's two main pipeline implementations in the processor. There's a six, six or seven stage, um, one called the cappuccino, which is a big one, and then a quick little guy called the espresso. Uh, there's a ton of handy features in the code base, things like, you know, it'll generate a, um, an instruction trace which disassembles the instructions as it's executing it into a log file. That's quite handy when it uh, runs off into the weeds and you have to figure out what went wrong. Um, again, just good coding, coding practices. Uh, I've licensed it under a, an interesting license which I put together myself. I'm not even sure if it's valid, but I hope it is. Uh, the idea is it's a source level file, a source level license, so it's, um, it's not really a strong, strongly reciprocal license. It's a weak weak copy left, I think they call it. Uh, and there's a pretty good test suite which we have, which goes along with it. So to basically verify its functionality, prove to anybody that downloads it that it actually works. 
Um, and if anybody is familiar with uh, you know, doing digital design and writing IP cores for a living, you'll understand that if you want to sell this thing or have people convince people that they should use it, you have to prove that it works. And that generally takes more time than writing the thing. You know, if you look in your code base, you'll probably have the design is about 30% of your source lines of code. And your verification, your testing is the other 70. So it's a big deal. And I don't think it's done properly enough in open source hardware projects. But I'm trying to change that. Uh, and of course, you know, we run this thing properly. Uh, collaboratively. Previously, a lot of the open cores work went on, sorry, a lot of the open risk project work went on an open cores, and they had a, an SVN repository behind a registration wall and, and some sort of homebrewed website where you'd have to go on and um, manually update HTML to put information on the page. And so gradually, we've migrated all of that to being on a wiki on open cores, a lot of the information, and then um, basically all of the code now goes on GitHub and we have mailing man. Mailman mailing lists, and of course, IRC. So here's a bit of a block diagram of the, the cappuccino pipeline. So um, sort of left to right is the flow of how things go through the processor. Um, yeah, so this guy, in terms of features, basically has everything that is in the 32-bit version of the instruction set, or the, the, the architecture. Uh, so it supports MMUs, caches, it's got all the timers and everything in there, I just didn't draw that. Um, one of the more recent efforts by Stefan Christensen, hello, if you're watching at home, uh, is, is uh, atomic, atomic transactions or load link store conditional instructions so that we could do um, multi-processor synchronization. That was something that was sort of in the, in the instruction set a while ago. Uh, we found it in an old draft. Um, but it, it had obviously never been fully thought through and implemented. So he went ahead and did that uh, with, with uh, Stefan Walentowicz as well, I think. And they now have a, a multi-core MR1KX set up running Linux. And I'll, I'll talk about that later. But so that's kind of what it looks like. And at the moment, it is outperforming the, the previous incarnation of the main open risk processor, the OR1200. So the other version is more targeted at RTOS use. So there's no MMUs, no caches. Um, it, it's actually supposed to be a very, very deeply embedded processor. So you can actually run the Cappuccino without the MMU, obviously, if, if you're not planning to run Linux or something. Uh, this guy, the pipeline, is, is quite small. And I've left out something like a cache uh, and tried to make sure that the fetch logic can actually burst out of a tightly coupled memory. So the idea is it's just essentially sitting there pulling its instructions out of a, a RAM that's close by. And uh, you should get relatively good performance, but at the same time, the idea is you're not planning to clock this guy too quickly, and probably he's, uh, he's not going to be doing anything too critical. But it's just a small, lightweight processor that you can have there. Um, and it should be easy to use. Cool. So a bit of a status about the project, where we are at the moment. Um, again, I haven't really been hacking on it too much in the last year or so, because work have been working me very hard, but um, the, the Stefans have. Uh, and the Cappuccino is in a very good state, I must say. So as I said, they've added the, uh, the atomic uh, access support into the RTL, and they've been doing lots with it, you know, just improving performance, putting in things like store caches. So just basically tuning it and making it better. And as well, obviously, the thing's getting a ton of testing while we're doing that as well. So it's quite a mature little project now, so um, very nice. And Stefan Melentowitz, again, it's, it's uh, unfortunate he can't be here today. He was going to talk about his project uh, where he's basically doing a many core SOC, and he picked up the MR1KX to, to work uh, with that on. Um, and so he, he's been using it quite a bit as well. And so they've been doing things like putting in cache coherency, and things like that. The Espresso core, OK, my fault. It's less, less actively developed, but it still works. Uh, so he, he, I'll quantify this. Basically, for a six-stage or seven-stage um, processor at 50 megahertz on a relatively recent Altera FPGA, you'll use up 5,500-ish logic cells and about 2,000 flops. And so if you're using caches and MMUs, you'll then have a 
or so kilobyte block RAM sitting there, um, which you'll need. On FPGA, it's about the same. 5K LUTs. Uh, so some numbers. You, you'll get 1.8 core marks a megahertz, which is actually not that bad, I think. Um, but what is really cool, and in fact, just this morning, I think Stefan got uh, multi-core Linux up and running and running core mark, and the number he got out of that was 3.34. So well done, Stefan. That's quite cool. And uh, the Pronto Espresso, okay, it should be smaller. <laughs> it's about the same size as a six-stage pipeline. I don't know what's going on there. I've got to gotta fix that. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so the core is interesting in and of itself, but I think probably what is more interesting is the ecosystem that goes around developing microprocessors. Um, I mean, there's a ton of stuff that goes on, right? Uh, you've got, you know, I've, I tried to find a nice picture to depict some of the things which, which you need around like a microprocessor project to just test it and implement it and make it work. Uh, here's another view of actually how everything works. At the end of the day, you're kind of getting it to run code. This is a laser pointer, right? Yeah, cool. All right. So, uh, uh, I guess, well, this is where it actually ends up kind of running at the end of the day. So down here, you've got your PC, and we have a couple of simulators which you can use. Orc sim is like the main model written in C, runs pretty quick, runs, runs at about a megahertz on a recent i5 um, uh, computer. We've also got a QEMU or KEMU uh, model, that's quite nice. We've also had a uh, model of the, the open risk written in JavaScript, so you can go to a website and actually see an open risk model boot Linux in front of you in your web browser, that's quite nice. Uh, and then there's actually the, the RTL simulators that we use. So, um, you know, you can compile the RTL into an RTL sim uh, using Icarus. Icarus is a great little simulator. Or you can build a cycle accurate model using Verilator and run your stuff. But it's obviously quite slow, like 10 kilohertz maybe, if you're lucky. Um, and then, of course, the FPGA. So then what you're doing... Well, this is, I guess, talking about compiling software into various targets. Um, but it shows you the part of the ecosystem that we have in terms of, uh, you know, this stuff's all bare metal, uh, libgloss and ulib-based software. And then we have our Linux stuff over the other side. That's quite a nice view. So what you're going to need to start with or end up with is some sort of system to tie it all together for you. So you have all, your, all of your cores. It's not just a microprocessor. It's memory models. It's buses to tie it all together. It's peripherals like I squared C or Spy core or Ethernet Mac or whatever. And then you need a way to tie all that together and do things for you like launch a simulation or shove it all into an FPGA synthesis tool uh, with constraints. And we've had various incarnations of these tools over the years to do this. The one which we're all sort of getting behind now is Fuse SOC, which is actually nothing to do... Well, it came out of ORP SOC, but actually Olaf Kindren, if you're watching at home, hello. Um, he, he started this project um, and is, is making it kind of open risk agnostic. So the thought is that there's, there's a big demand for these sorts of systems, you know, which, which automate um, open source IP gathering and bundling and, you know, putting it into the simulator for you. So this is quite a neat little standalone project which, um, which is being worked on at the moment and uh, most of the open risk development now uses Fuse SOC. It's quite handy. Uh, there are a couple of others. There was Orp SOC, which Fuse SOC came from. It's now kind of deprecated. And Min SOC is another little um, nice little project that just works out of the box. You download it, you run a command, it'll build you an FPGA image. It's quite nice. Then, of course, we've got software tool chains, as the diagram um, alluded to before. So we've got, we've got a bare metal and a Linux-targeted one, um, and a ton of work goes into them. It's actually non-trivial to go and do your own tool chain port, make sure it all works and all your libraries are up to date. And there's an LLVM CLang or Clang backend that, that uh, apparently works as well. I'm not sure how much use that gets, but it exists. So then another big challenge, when, when you've got all your 
microprocessor there, and it's either on an FPGA or a simulation model. You've got to talk to it. You've got to somehow you know, get code into this thing and debug it and run it. And there's a ton of different ways of doing that. And again, this is all quite tricky stuff to get working, but it's critical to you know, using the thing that you wrote. So uh, you've got stuff to talk to the hardware, so you'll need dongles or some sort of way to go in over the FPGA's JTAG interface, and uh, that's quite tricky to get working. Then, as well, another cool thing you can do is talk to a simulated model. So you've got your processor there running in simulation. Um, we've got ways of actually also attaching the debug proxy to that, and then like GDBing into that and debugging it, which is quite handy. Very, very useful. Um, then, of course, there's tons of software, which you run on top of all this stuff. So the point is that there is a lot to play with when you're, when you're doing microprocessor development. And it, it's very fun. I think I said earlier on, I mean, the whole point of this thing, I think, is that it's not that difficult, and it's a ton of fun. And at the moment, it's really, you know, there, aren't, there isn't a, a solution, or there isn't an option, really, for people who want to come along and, you know, in the proprietary world, or a, a commercial silicon or semiconductor company to come along and take a, an open source IP core. They, just, they rarely do it. We saw a handful of uses of the OR1200, and there's probably a, a few good reasons for this, but um, I think it's a shame that it isn't used more. And I think that open source RTL, at least, and open source digital design um, is missing a trick here. When you see the, the um, uptake of sort of open source software and, and similar sorts of things by industry, by the software industry, you wonder why you don't get a similar uptake in... Uh, yeah, the commercial semiconductor world. So this is one of the things I'm trying to address with this project. And uh, so as a bit of a footnote on all, all of this, I wanted to talk about the licensing, which I think is one of the things which um, keeps industry away from open source digital design. And initially, everybody just used software licenses for RTL because, hey, it's on a screen in front of me, I type, it's a bit like software, let's just put a <laughs> software license on it. But no, that doesn't work because it's different from a binary that runs on your, on your computer, right? Um, it's, it either gets turned into a circuit, which then gets synthesized into a, an ASIC, or it gets turned into some sort of binary blob which you stick into an FPGA, and then their circuits emulate your circuit. Uh, and in either case, it's a very different thing, I think. Um, so what I tried to do was basically put together a license which like, okay, it, I think it's very hard to have a fully reciprocal license because um, you just can't give away all of the IP which goes into a, a, uh, a silicon chip, basically, or into an FPGA for that matter. You know, is, uh, is Xilinx going to give you the schematic to their PLL or whatever um, if you do an FPGA and, and, and ship it with, with uh, GP old RTL in it or whatever? It's not going to happen. So. Uh, I think, I think it's still an unsolved problem. I had to go by having, as I said, a weak copy left license, which, it, you know, the boundary was the source file level. Uh, so it would be nice if people came along, they use your core, they make modifications or fix bugs. All I want back is that file with the bug fix in it or whatever. Um, I don't want everything else they're using. So uh, it's... I'm, I've not seen any of this stuff tested in court yet. I mean, there's, there's people like CERN who actually have a pretty good license, but again, I, I don't think that's um, permissive enough. And the TAPR guys, I mean, again, a lot of those licenses are really for PCB designs and things like that, so I'm not sure it directly applies to RTL. In fact, the CERN one, I'm pretty sure, isn't really supposed to apply to RTL and digital design. So I think this is another interesting avenue of, of work to go on in the open source digital design world. Anyway, that's the end, and uh, you can go and have a look at how to get this processor up and running on, our, on the, the thing's GitHub. There's our open course page. Come and hang out and tell us what doesn't work on IRC, and now ask me questions. Thanks, Julius. Let's see if there's questions. Uh, I have a little bit practical question. 
maybe from a little bit unusual side. Yep. Um, how do you think whether it's possible uh, for master degree students to deal with it, to improve their uh, well knowledge of architecture and the um, possibility to combine blocks together somehow? If speaking about open risk or similar projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's tons of master's level projects that go on um, which deal with uh, microprocessor, microprocessor architecture. Um, actually, coming out of Berkeley at the moment is the RISC-V spec, which is a very interesting um, bit of development. Uh, I mean, I, I did a lot of my open risk work as, as part of my master's degree at uh, KTH in Stockholm. So yeah, it's definitely accessible. And that's one of the main reasons why we go around and we run workshops and tutorials for people and we put stuff online and we hopefully try and make it dead easy for, for people to um, interact with this stuff. We, we really want to lower the bar or the barrier, lower barriers of entry to this uh, sort of stuff. Uh, yes, I understood. Uh, but uh, if speaking about, uh, not about the master degree project, but about some regular course. A regular course? Practice oriented, maybe, but still regular course. Oh, I see. Some sort of like online educational course for getting up and running with this stuff. Yeah, why not? I mean, it'll probably take a bit of time to put together or something, but uh, it's a good idea, actually. I mean, as I said, we, we try and put together tutorials. There's a nice tutorial um, link to off the wiki, which you can go to, which will get you up and running with it. Um, yeah, and then beyond that, just come, come and ask us how to do stuff. Yeah, it, it's very instructive to go and build something for FPGA and then figure out, you know, I want to talk to this peripheral and then go and like, understand how to do that. So. Maybe we should contact after that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um, what kind of uh, bus interface your uh, core has? It, is it uh, compatible with uh, AHB, for example, or a Wishbone? Uh, it is Wishbone, yeah. Is Actually, wishbone. there's two. There's Avalon, which is the Altera internal bus. Avalon, there's Avalon ah. bus, which is, it's all the same, right? It's all just like yeah. data request ready, blah, you know, so, whatever. Ma ma mainly Wishbone. Yeah, yeah, mainly Wishbone. Um, that's what all of the open cores um, peripherals really use. So for ease of um, compatibility. You, you have a, um, uh, you provide um, example designs uh, with uh, complete... Uh... We do indeed. That's, I was talking about uh, Fuse Sock here. Basically has canned systems, good to go. Like you download this thing, press go, it gives you a bitstream. Um, and you put it on your FPGA and then connect your debugger, download code, press go. Yeah. Which, uh, uh, which FPGA, which board? Uh, uh -huh. Altera Nano? Oh, sorry, uh, it's on the, on the slide. Yep, okay. so that's the Digilent Atlas, that's the Xilinx Spartan 6, and that is the... Nano. Yeah, the D0 Nano. So there's pre-canned projects ready to go for those. So you have example designs for this? Uh... We do indeed, yes. Okay. And you're welcome to contribute your own if anybody has a board that they've ported this to. Any other question? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, could you uh, explain a little bit the difference between, for instance, uh, licensing a um, Verilog code with BSD, for instance, and your own kind of copyleft license, what's the real difference? Okay, so the BSD license is very permissive, right? There's no restriction on, on anybody to give you back anything if they make something out of it, right? I think they've got to put your name on the box, but even then, not even in most recent versions of that. Is that correct? Like early versions of the BSD, if you use the code and distributed a product, you had to like put their name on it or something? Anyway. I think it's possible, yeah. But we, okay, if we, could, if we take a GPL, for instance, yeah. what would be the difference with your own license? Okay, so GPL is a strongly reciprocal license, so if you bundle your code with anything uh, 
well, hang on, you license your code under GPL, somebody comes along and takes it and then bundles your code with their code or anybody else's code, then they, have, they are required, if they compile a binary and distribute it, to also distribute a copy of the source of everything. Um, um, that's on GPL v3, I guess. Uh, it's all GPLs. It's, that's how the GPL works, is my understanding. It's, it's strongly reciprocal. So you combine that with anything else, all that code then has to be equivalently reciprocal and, and you have the same requirements on all of that code. LGPL tries to get around that by saying if you just compile a library that's binary compatible with this other guy, um, dynamically linked, um, then that's all right. You can put a system together which has the LGPL code in it and everything else can be proprietary and you don't need to expose that. But you just need to give me back the changes to the LGPL code if there were any. So that's kind of what my license tries to do. Except um, the idea of dynamic linking in a silicon chip doesn't exist, right? It's all basically the equivalent of static linking. You put it all together and there's no opportunity to swap in something else like after compile time or whatever, or at runtime, which I guess is powering the chip up or something similar. Maybe with a live reconfiguration, I don't know. Well, it, but again, after you've compiled the thing, so you've either synthesized the netlist of the chip or you've synthesized the FPGA netlist and put it through the place and route tool, you, there's no way to do what dynamic linking does, which is at runtime load this thing up. There's no option for it to use something else, which is the idea behind the dynamic linking um, kind of thing. Uh, it's kind of like the get out clause of how, and how the LGPL works, which is you, you, can, you can possibly um, swap in something else you know, at runtime. It, it should be binary compatible with that. So I, I argue there's, there's no equivalent thing in the hardware world. And um, what I do want is not to give away my source and never hear from the people that use it ever again, because that's kind of pointless. What I would like is the requirement that if they take it and they fix bugs in it or whatever, um, in the code, in the files that they got from me, I want that back. Like if they extend it, if they put stuff around it, if they put stuff into it, or, you know, and it, and it didn't modify the original files which I gave them, then that's cool, I don't care. But, you know, if they make bug fixes, um, I want to know about it. So that, that's kind of what my license tries to do. It's, it's basically a version of the Mozilla public license, but I've changed the word software for hardware description kind of thing. Yeah. OK, thanks. That's the thinking behind it. I have another question, technical yeah. question. Um, do, you, do, do your design use uh, specific resources on the HPGA, like uh, DSP blocks? Uh, that's a good question. So one of, one of the ways that you write open source code, or one of the things you have to be careful about when you're writing this sort of code is to try and make it FPGA agnostic. So you, don't, you try to instantiate as few technology specific um, so, blocks so as possible. So in, prin prin in principle, it could be easy, easy to port to another uh, yeah. FPGA. Uh, so the processor itself is completely technology agnostic. agnostic. I'm pretty sure. I don't think there's any anything instantiated it's, there. It's all, all, all the memories, for instance, are inferred as block RAMs because we write them correctly. Okay. Um, in the systems, though, you do have clocking primitives, so PLLs and DCMs. But again, they are in a single file. You know, it's very easy if you want to port it to a different FPGA family or technology. Um, yeah, you just change that one file or whatever, and then it should just work. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I'm afraid we have to move on to the next talk now. So any further question, please take them directly to Julius. For now, let's just thank him one more time. Thank you.